Uh, good morning, or good afternoon. Um, I'm Renee and Julian. Um, today we are going to uh, be talking about data management planning and um, specifically through the lens of um, public access mandates and federal public access mandates. I just want to make sure everything's um, displaying properly. So we're going to start working by working through definitions of research data and data management, specifically using government definitions to help us with those DMPs. Um, and then um, Nick's going to talk a little bit about the research data management uh, and the data lifecycle. And um, we're going to work through uh, small things like data formats and types, because the point of this workshop is to help you write data management plans for things like um, NSF proposals. And how many of you have ever written a data management plan before? Well, you came to the right workshop then. We're going to end also by talking about the things that the libraries do to support um, data management work and plug some of our own workshops as well. If you have any questions, um, just feel free to speak up or raise your hand, uh, but we will also leave uh, time at the end for questions. So the, um, the definition for research data that we use is um, from the actual Code of Federal Regulations, um, and it's the factual material commonly accepted in um, the scientific community that's necessary to validate or reproduce research findings, right? So the actual definition of research data from the Code of Federal Regulations is written in a way that sort of like highlights reproducibility. Um, it also uh, loops in things that are not data. It actually specifically says right under the actual um, definition in the Code of Federal Regulations, it has things that are not considered research data. So these mean things that do not have to be put into a data management plan. That's a preliminary analysis, communication with colleagues, um, drafts, ideas, things like that. Right, so in a data management plan, it doesn't mean you have to share every single thing that you did, like lab notebooks and all that throughout the process, but it does have to be enough to replicate that study. Uh, other examples of things that aren't research data, um, uh, personal or personnel and medical information. Um, I know we got some questions about NIH, so that's one thing that's specifically pertinent to that type of research. Um, also, trade secrets and commercial information, things like that, patentable um, things uh, are exempt from data management plans. These are a couple examples. Um, I had to put my slides out of order a little bit. Um, so documents, spreadsheets, um, these are the things that you typically, the data management plans that I, I've worked with you all throughout the years on, most folks remember to put that stuff in the DMP. It's the things on the right-hand side that um, doesn't often get um, recorded. I put lab notebooks there. Actually, it's an intentional point of contention. I forgot to erase it, but for the most part, lab notebooks aren't actually considered research data and don't need to be included in the data management plan. And research data management, um, it actually concerns the organization of research data throughout the entire research life cycle. So data management planning involves everything uh, from like project ideation all the way to archival and um, and uh, like permanent storage of that data set, everything in between, like metadata creation and things of that nature. And the point of data management is to um, is to make sure that results can be verified and uh, replicable, but also because it permits new innovation um, and new discovery, because of information and data are readily publicly available, then other scholars can access it free of charge. Um, some of the things that come up um, in the practical management of everyday data. Um, Obtaining the original file set, that's usually the biggest hurdle to replicating studies. Um, and also proprietary file formats, so like things through specific microscopes or specific instruments that can't be converted to more um, interoperable things like CSVs and PDFs. Um, incoherent data, data you know, with um, variable names that don't make sense or aren't intuitive, or um, in many cases just missing values in a spreadsheet and you don't know if they were intentionally left out or if there's some sort of pattern to it. Um, and uh, one that I highlighted was lack of data documentation because that's um, one that even in good data management plans and good um, projects, that seems to be something that we all fall short on is documenting our own methods. So that's things like creating metadata standards but also sort of data dictionaries these, um, and like sort of narratives explaining why you chose to code a variable in a certain way, why you chose to um, put zeros in a um, value in a spreadsheet as opposed to null. Little things like that that help the researcher connect with your data set. Um, all of these problems actually led to um, a federal response, right? And so in 2013, um, the former director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy um, issued, a, and that's part of the White House, issued a memorandum to any um, agency that issues more than $100 million a year in funding, which um, includes like the NSF and the NIH and a lot of other agencies, 
all of those agencies had to make a plan for all of the data um, that their projects are funding. All that data had to be made publicly available, and all the publications also did too. So what each um, each agency did over the course of 2013 to today, or even changing and evolving, um, is each agency created their own data management policy um, and then attached that to sort of uh, different awards and things like that online. And um, every one of them has a lot of the same elements, but they're all different enough to where you have to actually sort of read them and understand them before you actually submit um, your application. And I included uh, the Gate, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Sloan at the bottom just to illustrate that it's not just federal funders that are coming up with these mandates, but also private funders. Um, I don't have any humanities organizations listed, but NEH and um, other organizations do have very similar requirements. Bless you. You gonna talk about the life cycle, Nick? I am. All right, I'll let you advance the slide, please. All right, thanks, Renee. All right, so as Renee mentioned earlier, um, data management plans will encompass all of the different phases of the research data life cycle. And so I just wanted to talk for a couple of minutes about what the research data life cycle is, what makes up a good um, data life cycle. So this is sort of a general research data life cycle where you start kind of with planning. So planning your research, this is where you would ideally do your data management, plan out how you're going to work with the data throughout your project, um, from collecting and assuring the data, um, describing it with metadata practices, um, and then preserving it and archiving it in some sort of way. Um, not all research goes linearly like this. Obviously, you can be in more than one step at once. You can go in many different avenues. Um, but this is just sort of a general picture to give you an idea. Um, doing a data management plan early um, will ensure good data stewardship uh, throughout the entirety of your research project. And so just a little bit about each step. We won't go necessarily into detail about all of these, um, but the first step would be to plan it. Um, so describe the data, write your data management plan. Um, then obviously collecting is when you're running experiments, you're collecting your data, you're out doing interviews, you're out doing field work. Um, describing, um, so using appropriate metadata standards to describe your data, so why you did an experiment a certain way, why you're coding values a certain way, and writing that in um, to your data sets and making sure it accompanies it. Then preserving your data, so submitting your data um, to some sort of a repository, um, some sort of an archival system so that it's usable and findable by other researchers and so that it's preserved for future use. Um, that's something that should go into a data management plan um, that is part of the research data life cycle. Um, and then finally, um, discover, integrate, and analyze. So um, this is both either you or other researchers um, analyzing your data, um, combining different data sets, sort of depending on whatever field that you're in. And so moving on a little bit from uh, general uh, data life cycle um, is the different types of data formats. Now this isn't an exhaustive list of every single data format out there. It's gonna depend on what discipline you're working in, what type of research that you're doing. But these are some of the more common ones that we see. Um, and you'll see some of these are um, sort of italicized, um, like PDF and XML. So these are more interoperable or open source uh, file formats. Uh, these can be read by uh, many different types of data analysis software, different types of computer programs. So whenever you're writing a DMP, um, the funding agencies and folks looking at that uh, really like to see um, files being saved in sort of interoperable or open file formats. Um, essentially, you know, if you save it in, like, say, Microsoft Excel, and Microsoft Excel in 10 years decides, we're going to completely change our file type, we're going to completely change our software, can somebody else goes to use that file, they're not going to be able to read it. So you won't be able to actually look at that data. Um, so saving it in something that's interoperable, that's open, that ensures that any researcher and yourself will be able to actually look at that in the future. And these are some more discipline specific um, data formats, um, like uh, crystal biotic information files, uh, chemistry. Um, I was a PhD in chemistry, so I used that one quite a bit. 
um, then FITS, and then meteorology. So these are just a few specific ones. There's also different file formats um, for instruments as well. If you're doing analysis on different types of instruments, if you're saving your data on there, um, they're going to output that in a specific file type. Um, but I will say a lot of instruments now will have the ability to save it as like a CSV file or a text file or something that's open and interoperable. All right, so the next thing we'll talk a little bit about um, is data repositories. Um, if you remember when we were looking at our research data lifecycle, um, sort of the preserving your data, archiving your data phase um, was very important, and this is a key part of your data management plan. Um, and this is something that you should think about sort of at the beginning and at each phase um, of your research. So whenever you're starting your project, um, you should be thinking, um, how should I preserve my data? What's the best way to do it? Um, are there uh, discipline-specific places to do it? Are there resources on campus, um, places to archive my data? Um, so that's something to really think about at the beginning. Um, and then write that into your DMP. A lot of your DMPs will ask you to specify where you're going to store your data, how you're going to archive it at the end of the project. And so one question that we get quite a bit is um, either how do I find one or what repository or archival system is appropriate um, for my research. And it depends a lot um, on your discipline, what type of research that you're doing. Um, we have some resources here on campus, um, such as Diginal, and then what Mark will be talking about later at the end. Um, but we also, in a lot of instances, will point folks to discipline-specific data repositories. And there's a really nice resource to be able to find um, which repositories are appropriate for my research or for my discipline, because there's hundreds of them out there. So we all don't obviously know every single one of them that's available. And we're actually going to do a little demo. If I can figure out how to get this out of here. Awesome. All right, so this resource, I love this resource. It's a really great um, database of um, research repositories. It's called Read 3 Data, uh, which stands for Registr Registry of Research Data Repositories, so Read 3. Um, so you can search for repositories in a couple of different ways on here. Um, so there's this search bar um, right here on the uh, front screen, so just like your Google search bar. Um, you can search for different subject areas, different specific topics. So if I say I'm looking for environmental science, um, you type that in and click search. Um, you'll then get a listing uh, which shows you all of these different data repositories. Um, and it gives you subject areas as well, so like oceanography, uh, geosciences, um, it tells you what type of content um, is uploaded to that repository, um, what country that repository is based out of. So you'll see some in the United States and some that are based in um, countries abroad. Um, and if you want to know more, you click on that. And then this will give you just a larger record for this. It usually will give you a link to the specific repository. Um, so you can go to that and find more information um, if you're interested. Um, the other way to find it, and this is the way I really like to do it, um, is you browse, go up to Browse, and Browse by Subject, and you get this really cool little color wheel. There's also a text option if you don't like color wheel. <laughs> there, there it is. But I'm, I'm personally a fan Sorry, of the color <laughs> Um, so this um, is broken out here by discipline. So you'll see here we have, like, say, life sciences, humanities, engineering, natural sciences. So you can go from really broad to more and more specific. So if we're, say, we're looking at life sciences, you click on that, now this becomes bigger, right? So it expands to include those areas on the outside. So I'm just going to keep clicking. So you can keep going pretty much until you reach this point. So now you have, let's say, biophysics, biochemistry, um, anatomy, bioinformatics. Um, we say 
cell, let's try cell. So now you see the same page here. So this is just another way to find it if you are just looking for a specific subject area. Um, this is what I usually start folks out as if we're just kind of searching for different databases and then you can really get in and see which one is most appropriate for your work. Yes, Who's the sponsor of this? Um, Data site? Yeah. I think so. I think it's a German organization. Yeah. According to Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> Good enough for me. Yep, so it's this uh, data, yeah, it's this data site. So they uh, um, do a lot with data citation um, and properly documenting your data. So they sponsor um, this portal along with quite a few other things. Gotcha. Thank you. Now, I'll put this on the front end of everything. Glad you asked that question. I'm curious. All right. So, maybe. All right, so, so I said, thanks. Now it's back to you. Yeah. So, uh, like I said earlier, there's um, all of the different funders have different um, specific things that they want in a data management plan. But these are the general ones that I kind of boiled down and sort of pulled that are in, um, represented some way from every agency. Um, the very first part of almost every single data management plan requirement is to create some sort of exhaustive list of all the data types and formats um, that your project is going to create. Um, this actually, it's not intellectually the most difficult exercise, but it takes a lot of time and, you have, and it's kind of tedious. The best thing to do is to make a little um, a table um, in like uh, Microsoft Word or something and shrink it down and just list the actual data type and then the file extension. Um, and funders, from, um, when we submit it that way, we've, all, we've never gotten any uh, negative feedback and it usually works really well. Um, documentation and metadata, so for specific um, funders, they may actually ask um, what is your metadata standard, so are you going to use like Darwin Core metadata for a you know, specific bio project, um, and or just a general sentence or statement about your data documentation um, practices. So, example, some of the things that I've seen on specific data management plans here at FSU is um, folks, will co they'll commit to making readme files on the beginning of their Excel spreadsheets that uh, mention how they code variables um, and basic like project documentation within the actual spreadsheet itself. Which in most projects, that's actually uh, completely fine, right? Data documentation, the biggest part about doing it, and I know data documentation is not the focus of today's workshop, but um, it doesn't have to be perfect. You just have to be consistent and you have to make an effort to keep track of that stuff. Um, usually there's something along the lines of ownership and responsibility. Um, FSU's data, man, um, for this part's really easy for most FSU researchers because um, for as far as responsibility, they either want a specific PI listed or if you're delegating that responsibility to a specific graduate student, you can actually, or other project collaborator, collaborator you can write that into the um, data management plan who's responsible for it, or you could say that we are all responsible for it collectively, which is also fine. Um, and ownership, um, F, you can actually just point to FSU um, the research data management policy that they have, which is, um, in a nutshell, specifically uh, FSU scholars are stewards of those data sets and that the university actually owns that data. Um, so what that means is that you're free to use the data um, if you were to go to other institutions, in most cases actually take the data with you, as long as FSU actually um, retains some ownership and actual copies of the data. And that, that's along the spirit of, um, you know, what would happen if someone left a lab and took all their data with them and all these people needed to graduate and pursue their career. So that's sort of the spirit behind that policy. And uh, most importantly, and the part that most people don't really uh, put a lot of thought into are methods for dissemination. So how am I going to make this public? Um, putting things in your um, data management plan and say, we will uh, put you know, it on a uh, website for uh, a couple of years. Those are the kind of ones that we see get sent back. Um, um, and they actually want, um, in some cases they've asked um, we've gotten referrals from the funding agency that say go talk to a librarian about um, finding an appropriate data repository. And in those cases, you can work with someone like Nick or myself, and we'll actually, uh, work, you know, work with you and try to help you find something that is um, specific. Or um, sometimes people put different parts of the data in different repositories, um, depending on the ca capacity. So I know if you have like spatial data as part of your analysis, you may choose to put that somewhere else so that people can actually interact with it in the repository. Any GIS people here? Okay. Um, yeah, so that's general data management uh, plan requirements. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to jump out of the slideshow 
And I'm going to go to a tool uh, called DMP Tool. The address is just dmptool.org. And I'm going to log in. Um, and we are affiliated uh, with DMP Tool, so you would click on your institution. You type in Florida State. And you don't have to use your FSU email. You could use another one if that, if that was your preference. Um, so in your dashboard, you can click on Create Plan. One of my criticisms of DMP Tool um, is that it doesn't really allow you to easily browse through different funder requirements. I wish that you could just list them all and click and look without creating a plan. Um, so you go to FSU. And so does anybody want me to look up a specific funder? Because um, I could do that. Um, otherwise, I'm going to pick an H. Yes, sir. OK. Which directory? Uh, EHR. All right. So you can put these things here. Um, but plan overview, it actually gives you your instructions. We'll make sure this is showing up properly. And so you see roles and responsibilities. That's kind of the ownership and rights. Yes? So can you have collaborators? Like we're all Florida State, can we collaborate the same plan? You sure can. And even if you're not at FSU um, or someone isn't on your team, you can invite them. Um, and if you ever want your librarians to look at it with you, you can just invite us and we can just go into the tool and provide direct feedback in there too, if that's easier. And so this is those specific ones, some ones that um, they specifically, in this directory, want a period of data retention, which is different, um, and third-party preservation. So under right plan, what I like is, um, it breaks it down here, right? This is where you can um, write it down. Also, I do, I, there are some usability issues in this platform. Most of the professors we work with actually like, they read it and then they write it in Google Docs because it's easier for them. So if, if you don't use DMP tool, I, I get that too. But all the information is queued in here. And so different information professionals make sure that it's up to date with the latest funder requirements. So you can write you know, your roles and responsibilities in here and it actually links, if you want to read the whole data management um, sort of guidance sheet, you can read it. And then when you're done, you can download it as a PDF or text file to copy and paste into your um, proposal. And we also have the sharing feature. Um, you can Keep this private, of course, um, and just use the tool for your own work. Um, you can make it organization, so you can have it to where anyone at FSU can view it. Um, there are some folks um, that, there are some libraries that have had initiatives where they've asked PIs to submit successful data management plans, and that will put them there for other scholars to use as resources. So there is an option to make it public if that's something you wanted to do. And you can also invite collaborators um, to this project, so we could invite Rachel if we wanted to, since your, name, your email address is already there. But we won't do that, because you have enough emails. <laughs> so we have a lot, we can help you with all this stuff. That's the long and short of today. Um, if you are working on a proposal, and um, you just want us to take a look at a DMP that you've already written, to see if it sort of matches with funder policies, and um, if it's doable, we're happy to look at that. Um, if it's very early on in the project, and you don't really know where to go and you've never, um, a lot of the uh, requests we get are from folks who haven't submitted a lot of grants. And so they may have never written um, a plan like this before. We can work with you from the very beginning and help actually look through your project narrative and maybe find some data types and formats that you didn't remember to put in there. Um, some data documentation things um, that you didn't actually incorporate over into the data management plan. Um, we can also you know, work with you to do research in re 3 data or um, look through other, um, you can actually find a lot of repository recommendations in the data management documentation that the funders have. Um, in many cases, specifically in environmental sciences, they'll um, recommend a couple different repositories for you. So you can look at those. But we're, we're available to, um, for consultation on those things. Um, our digital research and scholarship team is available to help you ingest your data sets into digital, which is our institutional um, data repository, as well as our um, research repository. Um, and uh, DMP tool is kind of easy, but if you wanted some tips and tricks on how to use it, um, 
we have power agents in the library that can show you um, how to do things. And um, we're an institutional hub of DMP tools. So if you need support or have questions, just let us know. We're available to help. Um, and we also support other sort of open science and open data tools like um, the open science framework. Has anybody ever heard of that? Save it for a different day because it's not data management planning. But if you're interested, you should email us. Um, we also have, um, do you want to talk about the data lit workshops? Sure. These are your workshops. Sure thing. Uh, so this is partially a plug uh, for some of our other initiatives. Um, so we have a series of data workshops uh, focusing on uh, different data tools, um, just general data literacy. Um, these were based sort of on requests, you know, on questions we were getting from students and faculty. And if you don't know about calendar.fsu.edu, the main events calendar for FSU, our workshops are also indexed in there. So if that's a tool that you already use to find out what's going on on campus, our stuff is also there. Yeah. Anything else you wanted to say about data lit? It's, it's on. Well, one thing I wanted to add um, is that um, our colleague, Jesse, Dr. Jesse Klein, um, she's our, does the same work that Nick does, right, in STEM support and research data management. Um, Jesse does it in social sciences, and typically her and Nick would be there. Um, the two of them would present this today. Um, and so, for those, I did see some folks from like urban and regional planning and other groups. Um, we do have specific uh, social science and humanities labyrinths that can help you um, with uh, not only data management plan support, but also like quantitative data analysis and things like that. So, any questions? Well, you can have more time to think about questions while we. Um, We'll turn it over to Mark and give this presentation. Does someone raise their hand? No, no it's distraction. Awesome, thanks guys. Is your stuff already up? So, so, so to, to continue on the data series, so we do this in collaboration with the library. If you feel that will be important and useful for your department, which we will be happy to come by and give you a presentation on whatever topic. So I'm going to give a little bit because we're I'm here as a service provider, as, a, as for our archival system. So I'll talk a little bit very. I'll be very brief. I think I was scheduled for five minutes, but now I'll just fill up the remaining fifteen. <laughs> so so first. Most likely, most people here don't really know about what the research and computing center. So I'll give a very brief introduction. We kind of are uh, an auxiliary unit under uh, central IT, and we kind of provide a cyber infrastructure to enable computing research, research, and, and trading. Um, what cyber infrastructure is is very broad term. Basically, means like a combination of networking, data storage, compute. So we provide. Um, uh, the HPC cluster, which is housed here in Innovation Park. We provide a number of storage systems. Uh, one is a very fast parallel storage system, one is a kind of an archival system, and I'll talk about that. And we provide training and workshops and consulting. Consulting, for example, if you have a project where you need to exchange data, if you have an instrument that produces data, how to kind of process that on our cluster. Today I'll be talking about our archival system, because otherwise I'll be here for another 60 minutes. We'll have better things to do. But if you ever have questions about any of our other services, you can go to our website. It's rcc.fsu.edu. So our archival storage system. So our bread and butter, we started out as an HPC facility, and we have a very fast parallel file system that's only used for our HPC nodes, and it's very expensive. But people were looking at an option to kind of store their research data. If they did experiments and they wanted to save that data, but they did not want to pay the full price. So together with uh, the provost of the provost and of the research, we came up with this kind of archival file system. Um, to kind of because people said, well, I can buy a hard drive for X amount, and you guys are 20 times as expensive. So the goal was to kind of get it as affordable as possible. So the Office of Research is subsidizing part of the rate, and it's, it's something around $14 per terabyte per year, which is actually pretty cheap. Our old file system was something like $1,200 per terabyte per year. So you can kind of, currently our, our parallel store system is like $300, but it's still a lot more expensive than this system. So this is used by a number of, of, of research groups currently. 
but mainly in the STEM area. We have um, groups in the College of Education that kind of use this system to kind of store some of their research data. They just basically had a number of loose USB drives in their lab and they wanted to put it on a central location. So the main use for this in storage is kind of a long-term repository for data. And it's, 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 it's not super expensive, it's not expensive, it's also not super fast, but it can be accessed with, with a number of standard protocols. Um, most of our users are, are Unix users, but we also realize that we have people who use Windows who don't really know how to use secure FTP or RSync. So we have a number of, of, of file system protocols in place. So it, it's, we try to make it easy, as easy as possible for people to access this and store it or share. We have a software that kind of works a little bit like Dropbox where you can have a folder and you can say I want to share this with these people. So outside collaborators can read or write data to it. Um, there's a group that has a microscope and they do they work contract work and they can share it with outside amateur people that can just download data sets. Now, what is our archival system not? And the first question people always say, is it a backup mechanism? And I have to stop them, this is not backup. Most people don't quite know what backup is. Backup is software and hardware. It's like, it's, it's, if you change something on your file system, it keeps that, the number of changes. What we just do is provide us a copy of your data. If, if you want to have backups, there are a lot of, a lot of services, Northwest Regional Data Center as backup office, as a service. Um, they have Mosi for your desktop, but we only provide archive storage, it's not a backup. So it's not also something that you can really mount on your desktop. It's, there, there's options to do that, but if everyone will do it, make it highly insecure. Now we will be there to help you to get data off your desktop if you have something on there. And it's also not super fast. So our, our main file system, we're talking about gigabytes per second. And here we're talking about a few hundred megabytes per second. Now most people will have a one gigabit network connection if they're lucky. So the network will be slower than our storage system, but it's just that people know that. So I made, as the last kind of slide, uh, in a kind of comparison. Imagine you have a 10 terabyte of research data which is for most people, for some people, it's, it's definitely not enough. We have people who are working with hundreds of terabytes, and we have people that's with five terabytes. But I thought I'd just come up with some alternatives. How do we compare with what other people have? So, archival storage, 10 terabytes for five years, is around $700, one time charge. The, the unsubsidized price is $1,400. So, it's 50% it's is subsidized by the Office of Research. So people always say, well, Amazon Glacier is, is cheap. But if you go online and you redo the calculation, you think, oh, that's, that's only 0 point, whatever, 2 cents per gigabyte per month. But if you calculate it up to 10 terabytes, you suddenly get it to $2,500 for five years for 10 terabytes. And that means you can store it, but you cannot retrieve it, because every time you retrieve it, you have to pay for this. That's the little cash that I'm with Glacier. Now, of course, you can also buy your own disks. And I said buy your own two disks. And the reason why I said two, because you really want to keep your research on one disk that you put in a drawer and then hopefully will work in four or five years. <laughs> well, probably not, so I said two. Now, USB 10 terabyte drives, two of them will cost you around 800. If you just have an internal disk in your laptop or your desktop, it will be around 500. So we kind of are. The goal was to kind of make it comparable in cost to kind of your own buy your own drive. It's just that I think that we are much more reliable, but that's my own, um, my own business. Now, there's also a Dropbox business, and if you look on the website, you can, um, it gives you unlimited data for a team of three people. The only question is really as much space as your team needs, but it's around $1,200. So this is kind of the options that are kind of well, more available. But, uh, the library probably has something to store data, but when you get into a large data set, like 10 or 100 terabytes, then I think we have a pretty good, good uh, offering. 
And if you have any questions, you can ask them afterwards, or you can go to our website, rcc.pacashoot.com. Thank you.